Welcome to Care Talk. I'm David Williams, president of Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll, the CEO of CareCentrics. Uh, so David, Amazon's been consuming a lot of oxygen recently about healthcare. Uh, what do you think the impact of the triumvirate, the hydra-headed triumvirate of <laughs> JP Morgan and Berkshire and the dreaded Amazon is going to mean for healthcare. You know, I, I think people are overstating the potential here. And I think really what they should do, you know, people think, great, I have all these problems in healthcare. You guys, why don't you solve it? You solve it with your, your little puny base of a, a, million, uh, a million employees. What I think they're going to do, what I think, here's what I think they should do, John. Keep it narrow, keep it on what Amazon is good at, and basically face, force the provider organizations to be more patient centric. Do things like, say, you have to have uh, online scheduling, self service scheduling. One patient portal, not like the five portals That's that I your, have. Those are your big ideas? Yeah. No, these are what I think is doable. And the third is make better doctor reviews, okay? Keep it narrow. Don't try to solve everything or you're going to end up with nothing. So I hear two things. One, they're not a threat. Second, a repetition of some things that we've, we've talked about before. I think that there, this is going to be a very big deal. I don't understand how you can bet against you know, Warren Buffett, Jamie Dimon, and Jeff Bezos and win. They, uh, that, I, I agree with you. I think the, the mo most of the, Wait, you the agree changes with me? are going to be marginally, okay. are going to be around and the Amazon effect. But it's going to start where you mentioned, and it's going to, it's going to roil through the rest of healthcare. There are plenty of, of retired booksellers who thought that Amazon was a small idea and was going to do part-time partial distribution of books at a low cost. I think Amazon is going to start at patient reviews, transparency, and price, and they're going to force a level of Con connectivity and consumer centricity that either healthcare systems are going to adapt to or die. In fact, I think they could be a, 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 a totally new distribution, uh, disintermediated distribution scheme for the rest of healthcare. Because if they provide better access to information and 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 to care, uh, they're going to be a hugely disruptive force. And I and I think that I'd love to have. Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett as my wingmen. Yeah, I wouldn't it's like the them. Cerberus with the three dog heads, right? And I, the, uh, I, I, I don't call those guys dogs. <laughs> they, they, they win. So I think, John, actually, we, we can. I don't think they're going to have that much of an impact. And this is what I would Wrong. measure it. This is what I would measure it against as my baseline. Okay. They could just advocate for universal single payer health system. It's not going to happen. And we're going to get universal care. It's not going to be single if, payer. Why do you want to have those conversations about Obamacare and single payer? That's ridiculous. Because I think that's. I think that they could, because I don't think they're going to be that successful. You know, other people have, have tried before. Let's, let's see where they go. I don't know, and I'm not let's really expecting welcome that them much. In. Let's welcome let's, in people who can provide exactly what you said as a starting point, online scheduling, access to a patient portal with, with all of your information, and better access great. to information. Le and then let's have them pull through service providers that provide transparent pricing, immediate access, and better feedback. We, that could be transformative to healthcare. All I, right. I don't know why you're so skeptical. So we're talking we about, need change. We're talking about the, yeah, change. This is like small change. And when you're talking about a million employees or whatever they have, it's just like a little tiny, Look at the little Amazon tiny health plan, like that big. On margins yeah. in, in, in the sectors they've touched. Amazon's gonna, gonna make a difference. All right, so Amazon, Amazon. But I thought this was a three-headed thing. So what's, what's with uh, Berkshire and JP Morgan? Are they just sort of like along for the ride as the, as the wingmen or, the, or to make it a hard, Cerberus? Hard to tell right now. Uh, hard to tell right now. There definitely are the wingmen in terms of Amazon could clearly provide technology, consumer centricity, and access and be a distribution vehicle for healthcare. Uh, but you've also got two of the smartest people in, a, in American business who are enormously frustrated with what's going on for their employees, the pricing, the outcomes, the transparency. And I think they'd be incredibly powerful advocates for change around solutions that Amazon can drive. So don't underestimate the trio. You know, I think Amazon uh, right now is very, very popular. A lot of people are cheering for them like you are. But maybe they're being smart here and trying to avoid the pushback of, hey, this monopolist is coming in and trying to, to hurt our business. And by having this coalition, they make it a little bit broader and insulate themselves. Well, disruption always has enemies, but we, but we need disruption. And I, I think that, don't, again, I think you're underestimating Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett. And anyone who's done that historically has, has, has been roadkill. Yuck. <laughs> do the Cerberuses eat roadkill or do they only eat fresh meat? Don't call them dogs, man. So They're anyway, winning. John, 
um, if we think about, you know, great, this is commercial population, mm -hmm. young, healthy people that work for, for companies, but the real costs are usually with older people, with, with Medicare. So who's looking out for the retirees? Who's looking out for the, the Medicare beneficiaries? Well, it's interesting that you initially are skeptical of how big an impact, and now you're wondering why they're not doing more. But we're not even going to get into that. But there's plenty of innovation in healthcare happening at the margins, as, as where disruption and innovation always happens. There's the independent living at home demo that Medicare did last year, which proved that with a little bit of cross-functional support, you can actually make sure your relatives and my relatives who are aging are much better served and, and more inexpensively served and much happier with care at home. You've got some very innovative Medicare Advantage and Medicaid managed care plans that are coming up with creative solutions on the ground that reflect the needs locally, whether it's urban or rural, and coming up with innovative solutions, whether it's telemedicine or services from nurses that are that are that are providing more service and helping folks actually heal and age at home. There's there's a number of solutions like that that are emerging, and I think that are going to be augmented by technology. We're just not hearing about it because it's not hitting the center of healthcare. But that that those innovations are emerging, and I think they're going to be relevant. Well, uh, John, I do think that also the you know bundled payments for care, the new the, the Let's BPCI stay away advances, from the wonky, is a good idea. You focus on right. payment. I focus the idea on care. of uh, looking at the whole episode instead of just just paying at the point of service for it. Like you did this to the patient, you did that to the patient, and get paid for it. The idea that someone gets paid to take care of the patient and help them get better is much more aligned with what the patient wants and needs. So I don't think you should be giving me a hard time about that. Well, I think I think that what's relevant about that. I mean, I think you're missing the point, which is uh, that what it's, else? What, it's, what it's else less, is new? <laughs> it's less yeah. about it's less about the form of the policy, BCPI, value based. It's really healthcare on a budget. Anything that moves us to healthcare on a budget, where it sounds provides like rationing, John. Transparency. Rationing. Rationing. No. no. No, death it's panels. called transparency. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're just, you're just. John, you're, death you're, panel. You're, 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 you're focused. Well, you, the good news is your guy threw those, the, 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 the panels that would evaluate care out. You know, don't, don't, nothing, don't, don't talk about Mr. Trump like that. There, there's a, there's a, anything that moves us to healthcare in a budget where consumers and, and employers can understand what they're paying for and they get information on how well it works is a good thing. And all this, all this kind of, Healthcare you know, sort of what? detail around BCPI this or whatever bundles are important, value is important, but really it's the basics. Why can't healthcare function like every other aspect of the economy and provide a fair price and transparency and outcomes? I mean, David, let, don't don't hide behind complexity. <laughs> I'll try not to. All right, John. So speaking about healthcare on a budget, let's move over to the UK, where your famous, most famous, and uh, favorite magazine, which sometimes calls itself a newspaper, The Economist, uh, talked about mine. a revolution in healthcare that's coming mm -hmm. uh, through data. Mm -hmm. And they said, for example, the doctor will be you now because the data is going to allow... That's ridiculous. <laughs> the the data is going to allow for self-diagnosis and for really empowering uh, I don't the want patient. you diagnosing me or you. I mean, you don't want unprofessional, unqualified people with an iPad saying, I've got a, I've got a new diagnosis. The, there is a relevance to big data, yeah. and there is a relevance to new tools. We're finding a lot more about cancer isn't one disease, it's thousands of diseases, even within the different disease categories. Where all of that big data stuff is going to go is that the amount of information relevant to patient care is doubling every few years where it used to double every decade. We're going to leverage practitioners, providers are going to leverage that information to provide patient-specific solutions, but I don't want either you or me diagnosing our care. We don't want to, we still need to let the professional experts who are service providers provide that, but they're gonna be augmented by the data. The Economist, again, is wrong. <laughs> well, John, okay, let's take away the point about self-diagnosis, where, where I would tend to agree with you. But in so terms of helping the you patient- You brought it up. I brought it up, because I liked it when they say, you know, the doctor will be you. But is it the doctor will be you, or is the doctor will be you? It's David. <laughs> You're missing the point. No, that that's what I am. Yeah. Again. <laughs> um, so David. Yeah, but John, but they can, they can. The patient. Forget about diagnosis. But in terms of management, management of the treatment. Okay. And having the patient to be able to participate with the doctor, having the technology and the data should allow the patient to be able to express their own preferences, to be able to help to evaluate the possibilities relative to what they actually care about. I, th I think patient opinion matters, but I, I don't want patients 
kind of sort of mixing their own bags of chemo and other drugs and then self-administering based on something they read on the internet. I think you're embedded in your solution is a notion of sort of barefoot doctors, uh, you know, kind of sort of uh, uh, tur turning into ev everyone is their own doctor and service provider. And that's really dangerous. The one downside to, 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 to an empowered consumer is one that, that's out of control. And I think that's kind of what you're suggesting. We, patients need more information, but they shouldn't mix up what, who the doctor is. It's like it sounds like you sound like Shoeless Joe Jackson, the doctor. <laughs> So, like out of control, I have no idea. I think, out of I control, like a wild nice. potato, you know, well, living I'm, in their own private Idaho. So, all right, John, and I, I see you let's really dial it back you to healthcare. All right, let's David. bring it back. Let's come bring on, it back to on, America. Come, work with me, because yes. I know you okay. did. I know work you didn't like that. You come back in. All right, yeah. All right, mm -hmm. back to America. Mm -hmm. So, we had last year was all about kind of you know whether Obamacare was going to be repealed or not, and you know, sort was of it repealed, David? The your guy says it was repealed. My man, Mr. Trump. President Trump, your president repealed. and mine, said it was mostly repealed as part of the tax bill. Okay, so 2018 is going to be more about what's happening in the states. So mm -hmm. what do you what do you see happening in the states? And do we can we take any uh, can can we take a solace from the innovation there? Well, I think we're we're, we're sort of in the middle chapters of a 20 year reform of our healthcare system from a fee for service system with partial coverage to one that's value oriented with full coverage. And I think the push. Of, of authority and innovation to the states is probably a healthy thing. I still worry about all those folks who are under or uninsured and the risk to them. But whether it's the, the things I like in, in the state, states where that are going to really go aggressively at uh, pharma overpricing or uh, some of the things I don't like, but I think there's going to be pushback where folks are now throwing pre-existing conditions or disenrolling Medicaid eligibles. That kind of roiling innovation and 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 challenge and response is, I think, going to we're going to come up with a better system that mixes the best of of what the local lo localities need and hopefully um, a supportive funding that can get everybody covered. Well, you know what Obamacare did was really scale up uh, a statewide. Innovation, which was really no, Romney care in Massachusetts, was, and put federal sure it did, and put federal funds against it, and showed what could happen. What we're moving to now is more of a two-tiered system, where the richer and more liberal states are, are putting in universal, you know, universal coverage by having individual mandates and, and Medicaid expansion, where some of the other states uh, are, are moving away from that. And uh, you know, unlike any place else um, in the in the world where people just have, have coverage. So I think what you're going to have is a, a degradation in a lot of states and others that sort of preserve the Obamacare features. I, that, but that, I think that's too simplistic, David. We, we, you're definitely going to have some of those themes. But as a practical reality, some amount of state innovation is a good thing because the solutions have to differ. And I think the vast majority of Americans are in favor of universal access. They just want to be provided in a relevant, low-cost fashion that's, that, 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 that's affordable. And I don't think that's unreasonable. Uh, but we, I don't think you're going to have the tale of two cities, except at the extremes. <laughs> you're, back, the vast, vast, you're back to London. Stay on topic. The vast majority of Americans want universal care at a fair price. All right. So, John, uh, we've gone from the wilds of the uh, Amazon jungle over to, uh, to London and to uh, back to the and U.S. You lost track a couple of I times. I lost track. I, I forgot we were going the barefoot doctors. Is that Cuba or China? I can't remember. Like probably both at different but times. But in any case, John... The question now is, are you ready for the lightning round? It's time. John, do you think it was right that the CDC director, Brenda Fitzgerald, was forced out recently? Of course. I mean, how can you be talking, smoking, <laughs> cessation, and, and investing in stocks? This administration doesn't really understand. Well, at least she's interested in smoking, <laughs> right? Well, I think, look, it was done through her investment advisor. It still was bad. We can't have that kind of inconsistent messaging. She should have been fired. You know, I, I kind of cut her a little bit of uh, slack for this one particular investment. But the fact is she's had to recuse herself from testifying before Congress on things like the opioid crisis because she has a con public health problem. Yeah, because she our has time. a conflict of interest. But the fact is here in this administration, you know, President Trump should have to recuse himself from everything. So what do you expect? So, David, with that, what do you think of uh, your president's description of the opioid crisis as an emergency? Well, I guess he declared an emergency, but uh, you really wouldn't know by looking around. You know, there was supposed to be this big, uh, big media attention given to it, money for the states. To me, it's a really a kind of a nothing burger. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. How can you have a crisis with as many people dying 
this year has died in Vietnam after the entire war. It's an emergency without resources. It's ridiculous. John, I know you love that iPhone. I'm actually surprised you're able to keep it out of your hot little hands for our filming of this episode. So are you going to be downloading the new health app? I probably will. I mean, as a practical matter, Apple is a great consumer product. They've got, they've created an entire e ecosphere where the patient, where the consumer can actually get access to more stuff. Hopefully it'll help patients. I'm in. You know, I have an iPhone too, but I also uh, have about five portals from different healthcare providers. So I think I'm going to wait on it. And believe I also- Believe in Apple, But David, I, I do, I do believe in Apple. You know, they have 100 million iPhone users in the US, compare it with the Amazon triumvirate million employees. I think Apple has a better shot than Amazon Great actually at, at this market. What do you think of this Medicaid program in, in Indiana, where if you don't pay, you don't get care? Well, my guess, John, is that it probably was done from a mean-spirited fashion. But the positive, the positive piece of it is that when people pay something, you know, they tend to value it more. If it's just for free, they don't value it. That and so if you, if, you, if you make somebody pay something, and they don't pay it, you got to have some kind of punishment. So I'm all right with it. There's never been a study that's shown that anything other than that work requirements and requirement to pay does anything other than create a barrier to care. I agree with you that, it, that, it, 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 that, that we should value health care and pay for it, but our focus here has to be on making sure that the most vulnerable people in our society get access to care and no barriers are created. It's a bad idea. Well, that's it for another edition of Care Talk. If we've informed or entertained or even uh, provoked or saddened you in some way, make sure to subscribe. Meanwhile, I'm David Williams from Health Business Group. And I'm John Driscoll from Carecentrics. Thank you.